Hi, I'm Mia Friedman, and welcome to this special summer episode of No Filter. Magda Zhabansky is an Australian icon. She's written some of our best comedy shows and created some of our favourite characters, and this year she's even been instrumental in changing the law. Since coming out in spectacular style on the project in 2012 as gay, 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 little bit not gay, 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 Magda has made it her mission to speak out for marriage equality in Australia. And in 2017, all her hard work and the hard work of many others involved in the marriage equality campaign has paid off. There's no denying that Magda was instrumental in making marriage equality legal in Australia, which is why I wanted to revisit this conversation. I spoke to Magda just after she released her memoir, Reckoning, in 2015. It was her first book and, my God, if you haven't read it yet, please go and do it because it's not just the usual celebrity memoir. It is an outstanding book. It's just an outstanding read. She's a beautiful writer. It not only goes into detail about her life but about her father's experience as a German resistance fighter in World War II And in our conversation, we touched on everything from her childhood to her contracts with Jenny Craig to the fact that she is not 100% lesbian. Although it was two years ago, I think this conversation holds up beautifully. Here's Magda. You've got a beautiful turn of phrase. Oh, thank you. Thanks. How did you do it? Um, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. I just, um, I I didn't know if I could do it actually when I first started Mm. writing. I didn't know if I could write. Uh, so it's been a huge journey. I started just after my dad died mm. um, and then it took all sorts of twists and turns. At one point it was going to be a book about my weight loss, although that was complicated by the fact that, of course, I put it all back on again. So there yeah. went that idea. But I really I, – I just discovered through the writing of this book how much in love with language I am, apart from all the other content stuff. And I suppose I've always played with language, really, with characters, and I've loved writing the scripts that I've been involved with. You wrote do- the three Dog Woman series. Yeah, yeah, Dog Woman and, um, you, you know, and a lot Big Girl's ske- Blouse and a lot of sketch comedy. stuff. But to actually just have free reign to really I, – I, it's, a, it's a pretty serious book, and I wanted to, the language to match the gravitas of the subject matter in a way. So, yeah. Did it take – was it a different muscle – to the one that you're used to using for obviously writing script comedy, but just you're a creative person, you act, you're multi-talented in that way, but did writing feel like a creative muscle? Because it feels like a a very different voice. Well, it's the real me. And in some ways it was actually easier. You know, writing sketch comedy is, I don't, you don't want to make it look like hard work, but it is incredibly freaking hard work because mm. it, you're straining. Well, for me, I was straining my brain away from the way it actually naturally works to put it into sketch comedy mode. Um, it requires a certain adrenalized, um, you know, high octane energy comedy. Whereas, uh, oh, pardon me, um, whereas this book flowed out of me much more because it really is the way I speak and the way I think and my sense of humour. It's much more the real me. It reads like you just sat down and wrote it like in a week, (laughs) (laughs) which I always think is the most, I mean, it's rarely that is it, but I always think that's, it makes it very easy to read and very, um, it doesn't read like it was agony. But it, no. you wrote it over eight years, right? Yeah, and it wasn't. And it, it was an agony. You know, a lot of it really did flow. You know, I understand what they talk about the Holy Spirit. You know, that, that there's something that kind of writes through you, mm. and there's some. Um, you know, in some ways, I think the book's smarter than I am. It's weird. You access some part of your own brain that's connected to the collective unconscious or something there's some force that animates and flows through you it's Mm. the same when you're doing comedy or anything creative you have that sense of flow that they talk about and um it's a strangely impersonal thing Mm, mm. um and um you know without getting too wanky about it no please get wanky (laughs) Let's get let's get wanky. I'm capable of it, you know. I'm <laughs> Me really, too. Uh, I can go right to the wank place. Um, but it really, uh, I loved writing. I absolutely. Uh, um, I said this at a, an event the other night, and there was sort of an ooh, you know. It's the. This is my favourite thing that I've ever done. Mm. I have to say, it's mm. the most satisfying and complete thing because it's humour, but it, but it's also the serious. It's it's the whole me, you know, much more. It's also the only thing, um, as a performer as you are, there are so many people involved in every aspect of what you do, if you're doing a show, if you're doing whatever it happens to be, but this is just you. 
Yeah, yeah, I can't hide no. in a scrum at all. Mm. But also you don't have the endless frustrations that you have when you're making film and TV about the budget, the location, mm. the costumes, all those, you know, dealing with reality things. Mm. Whereas with a book, you can really, um, although I was constrained because this is a real story mm. uh, and I was um, I had to adhere to the truth of that, but you can kind of go wherever you want to go with that. And there's no budget. You know, if I wanted to go and write about Warsaw in 1943, I could, you know, mm, and I didn't mm. have to worry about whether the the film had the budget for that. You know, the book can do that. So that was incredibly liberating. Yeah, it's a, it's called Reckoning and it's about um, you coming to terms with so many things. But it's a book fundamentally about identity, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is actually. It very much is, which mine have, and mine still isn't fully formed, I would say. I wanted to, it's going to sound funny, but I wanted to say thank you on behalf of Jewish people because I am the official spokesperson of all Jewish people. <laughs> no, but I am Jewish and I, I've, yeah. I lost relatives in the Holocaust and, and your father was the most extraordinary hero and he and his family in Poland risked their lives yeah. for a long time yeah. sheltering Jewish people and yeah. one little boy in particular um, because the price of doing that was their own death. Yeah, if they'd been caught. And, yeah. and um, as I describe in the book, my grandparents were 45 when the war started and that's not young. You know, you know consequences. My father was 15 and there's a certain... Um, you don't underst- Reckless youth. Reckless youth. You don't understand mortality, all those kind of things. So I'm really in awe of my grandparents' courage, particularly somehow my grandmother, really, and my aunt, um, you know, because she had the little Jewish boys to sleep in her bed, you know. I mean, uh, I mean, what would have happened to them if they'd been caught? Um, just doesn't even bear thinking about. And to... Well, they to, would have been killed and they knew that, or to- they? Well, they mo- most likely would have been tortured because of the unit that my father and my uncle were in. Um mm. Because my father and my uncle were in this unit, 993W, which was a top-secret counterintelligence unit. And basically they were executing Polish collaborators who were telling the Gestapo um, secrets of the resistance but also telling the Gestapo where, where Jewish people were hiding. Mm. Um, and um, the Polish you know, official line on that, they took a very hard line on collaboration. And it was an incredibly, I mean, not just brave, but moral thing that they yeah. did. You yeah, know? they were good people. They were good people. They didn't I, turn away. No, no, they didn't. And, um, you know, I, I asked myself what would I have done in the same circumstances and you just don't know, no. you know. But I asked my cousin, who's also called Magda, Magda Zawadzka. Magda. Magda, very glamorous Polish actress, funnily enough. Um, but I, I wanted to understand, it was almost like doing a taxonomy of courage, you know, in some <laughs> ways to try and understand where did that ca- courage come from, what informed it, and how did they maintain that over six long years. And I said to her one time, you know, where did our grandmother's courage come from? And she just said, breeding you know, meaning basically that they were brought up to have those values and they were trained in that way so that essentially when the time came, because mm. they were from that kind of stream of Polish, you know, there's, there's, Poland's a very complex country and its history with Jewish people is enormously complex, as I'm sure you know. Mm. But they were from that stream that was very kind of multicultural. They had a lot of Jewish friends and to them, as my cousin said, um, these weren't Jewish people. They were Polish people. Yeah. They saw no difference, mm. you know. Mm. And that's, you know, those sort of, um, that way of conducting yourself in the world is as relevant, if not more relevant now than ever, really. It's interesting, um, y- y- you know, part of what, what you write about is is the sense that traumatic life experiences can be um, inherited sort of through your DNA in the same way as blue eyes or blonde hair and there's a, a very strong understanding that of that among Jewish people, this sense of survivor guilt and yeah. the effects of the Holocaust as it's come down into generations who never experienced it but who are profoundly affected. Yeah. And the same thing happened with you, you felt. That's one of the things you experienced or yeah. you, you explored in the book. Well, I think I think really there's a kind of um, – I'm reminded of that amazing episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm where the little gay – he looks like a gay boy. Yeah. You know, he's talking about the Holocaust and he says, get over it, Jews, you know. <laughs> and there's that kind of an attitude sometimes that I, I suppose because of my proximity to it – I look at Jewish people and the suffering that they've gone through and and think about the toll that that must take. And Mm. often allowance isn't made for that, Mm. Um, like how how that would existentially affect you, you know, your Through generations. Through generations. And and I I met this um, young Polish-Jewish woman actually at a function and um, 
she was saying her grandmother hated Polish people. You know, she'd had bad experiences. And she was really surprised and relieved to hear about my grandparents. And and I thought it was really important and an important thing for the book too for Jewish people to know that there were Polish people that cared Absolutely. and that risked their lives. And for, for in order – and the reason for saying that is so that Jewish people – don't feel so alone, mm. you know, because mm. I think that's a horrible feeling to feel mm. like no one cared. It's like mm. people did, and it might not have always been evident, but there were people that did. Mm. And I think that's a really important message to get across. And the sense that it's not ancient history. It's within oh living memory. Oh, my God. Total, it, living memory. And, and I do think it's it's passed on somehow genetically. I mean, there's mm, all those studies they're doing now, epigenetics, they've done actually with Jewish second-generation Holocaust survivors and... And um, they've shown that you know, the effects of trauma and stress are communicated. And when you say that to people, everyone just goes, yeah, totally get it. Mm. You know, no one goes, no, oh, no, I don't reckon. Mm, you know? mm. Although I have other friends who are Jewish Holocaust survivors, second generation, and they don't want that to be true because they don't want to be burdened mm. with that. They want to mm. be able to live outside and beyond it, you know. Mm, mm. But, you know, we're all reckoning with something, aren't we? Your really? father is um, was an extraordinary man, an extraordinary man. I wanted to take you to a scene in the book that I really love. Well, there's so many, but um, one when you're playing soccer on the beach with oh, a group right. of friends yeah. on a camping trip. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, can you just talk about, about that? I loved that scene. Oh, yeah, I loved that too. Um, I This was after I'd lost all the weight uh, when I did Jenny Craig and, um, you know, there's one thing that I sort of grieve the loss of is mobil- physical mobility and I don't run. It's just too hard when you're overweight, you know. But even I, when you're not overweight, even when you know it's true, true, true. Um, and um, I went with a bunch of girlfriends. There's a huge sort of posse of us who go camping every now and then. And we went to Cape Levesque, and it was so beautiful. We were in the really rough, campy part of it, you know, where it's like Gilligan's Island. And there's this incredible stark beauty, as I describe it in the book. If they had, you know, beach resorts on the moon or Mars, that's what that that would be Cape Levesque. Um, and um, we were we were all down on the rocks at sort of on the cliff and the moon came out and it just illuminated the beach like this ghostly soccer arena and we all spontaneously ran down onto the beach and started kicking a soccer ball around and i was cuz i was the lightest i'd been for a very long time mm. and i was sprinting around and elbowing people and getting the ball and w- laughing so hard i wet myself <laughs> And it was the most incredible feeling. and But there was also, it was tinged with a slight sadness because I didn't know if it would last. And then it didn't. You know, I, I put the weight back on. So I had this sort of glimpse of it. But, you know, to be honest, I haven't given up on the idea of, um, look, oh, I mean, I'm in this perpetual bloody thing of, mm. you know, should I just accept my weight as it is or should I keep trying to lose weight? But You don't look overweight to me. I, oh, thanks. Love. But no, you actually don't. Oh well, yeah, you know. Look, I, I am carrying. More it's the first time I've met you in person, but, oh, but I, so. I don't like. You know. Look, I, I'm, I'm a naturally. My natural instinct is to be a camping outdoorsy girl, and I'm yeah. carrying a little bit too much weight to do that. Mm. So, so just to get to that sort of weight, there is, you know, would be really comfortable. But that's. You know, outside of all of the body image craziness of the, you know, I mean, we're so mm. nuts about it, all of us. And and I'm involved in that. It's hard to be a woman and be sane, I think, about your mm. body and it what is. you put into it. The three, the three, um, you, you know, the book's called Reckoning and the three issues that you reckon with throughout the book that weave in and out are your father and his history, your sexuality and your weight. Yeah. And they sort of provide this framework for a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, do you feel like they're intertwined, those three things, or at least sexuality and, and your weight? Good question. Yeah, I think they are. I think they are. Well, my father sort of started on at me. His mother was overweight mm. and he was overweight when he was a kid. And then he was in a POW camp and lost the weight and was very handsome. Um, and so... It was his Jenny Craig moment. <laughs> it was totally... <laughs> but he managed to hang on to it. He had an iron will, my father. Um and from the age of 11, he said to me when I put on, like, clearly I was just pubescent and I'd put on a tiny bit of weight. Mm. And he said, if you just lose half a stone, you'll be fine for the purposes of playing tennis because he was tennis mad. And his way of doing that is to just not eat. And starve he thought yourself. it was just willpower. He said, he said yeah, willpower, starve yourself, which is how he managed it. And somehow he did. Um, but it just propelled me into this absolute craziness. You know, it, it messed with my metabolism. Mm. I mean, God bless him. He was trying to do the right thing. Mm. Um, he had all sorts of complex 
stuff going on about you know about why I mean oh, someone God. who's been in a who's starved and been in a prison camp yeah. you know their their issues around weight must be manifest yeah but also you know his mother was overweight and yeah. he knows you know there was things have started to change in the last maybe ten years but it, for a long time overweight people were the last most vilified group you know i think still still i mm. think yeah yeah absolutely it's there's a lot of shame attached to it mm. it's a you know I've, I've seemed to have picked all the ways of being in the world that have shame attached to them mm. <laughs> um and uh slowly i'm just working my way through it and going you know what i, I, I ain't gonna be shamed no more um so whether or not the weight is a metaphor um uh, I, re- I read that fantastic book, uh, Fat is a Feminist Issue, yeah. years ago by Susie Orbach. Um, and then the, the sort of opposite side of that was reading Susan Sontag when she wrote about um, uh, AIDS as metaphor and illness as metaphor and, and, she, mm. and she disputed the idea of the body being a mm. metaphor for what's going on emotionally. Mm. Um, and um, Where did you land? I, I think it's halfway between, like everything, you know. Um, uh, it's the middle path. Mm. I think it's, it is it is both a metaphor and a, an emotional expression and it's also just purely, you know, in some regards just physiological and genetic. You talked about, you described it as a flesh armour that you created around yeah. yourself at a time when you were struggling with your sexuality, which is kind of for decades really. Um I wanted to ask you about so so the decision to do Jenny Craig. T- talk me through that because you write about that in the book. You don't write about it much, so it's not a yeah. huge part of the book. But the actual decision to do Jenny Craig must have been a huge one because by doing that, you take your weight and you make it currency. Yeah, for better or worse. Yeah. Did you realize what a big decision that was going to be? Probably not fully. Mm. <laughs> How could you? I know. I, I enter into. Uh, it's the same with this book. What have I done? Um, <laughs> <laughs> in some regards, um, but um, uh, I had gotten to a point physically and health-wise where I had to do something. I had shocking sleep apnea. Your and friends f- were worried. My friends were worried, and another friend um, who was doing the advertising for Jenny Craig approached me and said, "Look, they'd be interested. Would you be interested?" And I said, "No." And then a year later, I thought, well, "Maybe it's a good way to do it." There's a financial incentive. Mm. You, there's a mm. sort of a contract. You, you've got a structure around you. Um, you're publicly accountable in a way. Publicly accountable, but you've also got public support. Mm. And and I knew that um, because of being a public person. The, the public is so, and the media are so obsessed with weight loss and weight gain. Mm. I knew no matter what way I did it, it would be a public issue anyway. So mm. I kind of thought, why not just tackle it head on? Mm. Um, and um, so, really, that was how the how the whole thing went. And and um, um, I sort of wanted to, in some ways, say some. I thought it was also a platform to say some things about body image and the shaming of overweight people, and the fact that I was very clear about the fact that I had. N- no intention of getting skinny, but I needed to lose some weight. Um, but sometimes, you know, those, it's very hard to get a complex message through. But you were also honest um, in terms of, you know, you did interviews with Women's Weekly and you talked about how it, there was also the, the therapy was required yeah, and yeah. how it wasn't just, I'm just going to eat a few meals and yeah. magically the weight will fall off. Like you were very open and honest about it. Yeah, yeah, I was. And um, thanks for um, picking up on that mm. um, because I was really conscientious about that and certainly I, you know I've done a ton mm. of therapy mm. in my life um, you know I think everyone should do it mm, absolutely oh, isn't it the best thing how, I don't know how anyone can get through life without doing it no, frankly I don't. well you see people and they, they don't struggle. Really. They, they, I, I don't see why you wouldn't avail yourself of the skills mm. and the tools mm. if there's a smarter way to do something you don't do your own dental work no exactly don't fix your own well I don't fix my own car maybe <laughs> some people can but no I see it in the same way Totally, me too, me too. Mm. Um, but yeah, I very much wanted to get across. I think there is, there are really complex um, emotional, psychological things that go on with weight. Mm. Um, the whole thing, I, I actually think, no one really understands Mm-mm. it. You know, the, the, it still eludes them. Just it's exactly hard to how unscramble the egg between society's yeah. expectations and our history and our parents and the messages we receive and the messages we internalise. It is hard to unscramble yeah. all that. But you did lose all this weight and you talk about how at the age of 50 when most women are becoming invisible, you were swimming upstream because suddenly you're in a black tight black dress, you're on the cover of Women's Weekly, men and women were flirting with you. What was that like? Was that the first time you'd experienced being valued for how you look? Yeah. In a positive way. Yeah, yeah. Because I put weight on um, in my early teens and I sort of, uh, you, you know, I sort of felt 
that I could hide within that in a sense. Mm. Um, but this was the first time, you know, I'd always been the funny one. Mm. But suddenly I was like the hot one. The hot and one. I was, and I, I was amazed that people at were saying that. At age 50. That. I know. I was sort of really taken aback. But people kept, kept kind of saying that. And I was like, well, I suppose so. All right. Then I'll go with that. Um, and it was. It was a really extraordinary experience. And it quite unnerved me in some ways and there's, this, sure and there's this whole sort of myth that you lose weight and then it, all your problems go solved. away yeah. you know and it everyone knows it's not like that you know you you what people hap- still think it's like that i though. know they do and they want to keep thinking it's like that and did and, you think that it would be like that in um, some way probably a little bit mm. yeah how yeah. could you not how could you not you, you mm. just get won over by that stuff don't mm. you mm. um and you know certainly a, a lot of you know pains and aches and things like that were solved by mm. by losing weight and health issues certainly um but you know you've got then a whole lot of uh, other set of issues to address and as i describe in the book suddenly i became really self-conscious about the way i looked and i felt like a bauble you know yeah, and i, love I, that I and, description. and i get now how um i'd always felt that side of that I was always a sort of nerdy one you know and I didn't ever use that as currency Mm -hmm. and suddenly I got how other women felt for the first time I think really and because the the double side of that is that you get it but then you know you can lose it because we're all going to lose it whether it's weight or getting older or yeah well going gray whatever it happens to be you can't stay hot forever yeah although society tells us we should try yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah absolutely but you you said something really interesting because you said the sexiness of fat women is like a dirty little secret and so it's not like you hadn't experienced people being attracted to you Mm. and experienced what it was like to feel sexually desirable Mm. but this was it, it was it was like what, what did you mean by that well that really a lot of people won't admit to feeling attracted to fat women you know um mm. especially men mm. there's a real you know that whole weird fat feeder shape, thing uh, there's the feeder thing and then there's those college frat boys that sort of you know do all the things about fat girls won't won't screw a fat girl that kind of thing no i don't know oh, about yeah, that. There, oh, there's 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 whole fat shaming things that go on about that but um, you know, um, this is one thing that the internet has done for us and porn is it reveals that people have all sorts of sexual yeah, tastes right. that are not you – know, we constantly have shoved down our throat that there's one type of desirable body. Miranda Kerr. Miranda Kerr. Mm. And it turns out that actually people are attracted to all sorts of things. Who you knew? Know? Who knew? Who knew? Mm. Well, we didn't for a long time, I don't think, you mm. know. So, mm. yeah. So, so did, how did that change? Like were people just more open about it? Well, um, when you lost the weight, yeah, and I mean, I was still, I was still what would be classified as overweight, but I think maybe because I was just packaged in a different way or something, um, uh, thanks to the stylists, mm. um, yeah, people were really engaging with me in that mm. way, and I was like, oh, wow, this is a must whole be a new weird thing. thing to sort of participate in your own objectification and have yeah. it as something you haven't sort of that's something quite sudden. Yeah, it was. It was very weird. Suddenly I was the object of the gaze, you know, yeah. and I'd really felt that somehow I'd existed outside of that. Um, you had. Yeah, I, I really had. And suddenly I, I, I went, oh, my God. I'm... And you'd been valued for other things, how yeah. funny you were, what you could say, what you could do, your talent. And then suddenly it's like, oh, she's hot. Yeah, bauble. Yeah, yeah bauble. bauble. So it's like yeah. the, the plus and minus of that. And then, of course, then people started stalking you in paparazzi and let's get Magda eating and let's get Magda in a swimsuit. That must have been horrendous. It goes through a cycle. What happens is initially it's absolutely horrific and you feel like hunted prey, yeah. you know, because the way they follow you is like you're an animal of prey. It's it's really awful. It's like having wolves coming after you. Um, and and ex- I think the lizard part of your brain just responds to it like that, you know. Um, but then after a while, uh, after they've done the worst they can do and shown you shoving food into your face mm. and, you know, the most unattractive Angle angles the they worst. can get yeah, and all of yeah, that, yeah. you know, you and your bathers at the beach and all yeah. that sort of stuff. In another way, and I'm not saying that the paparazzi are providing a public service, but um, <laughs> in another way you come through the other end of it sort of, liberated because you just go well what are you going to do you know yeah i eat you know i eat food yeah. yes I, right you know yes I, I i go down the street looking windblown with no makeup on and my tracky pants on um there was a real gotcha about it though wasn't it a there real was a gotcha. real uh, uh, yeah. 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 yeah 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 it was not and done in a 
No, and Schadenfreude, you know, glorying in my sort of, you know, um, they didn't go too far because there is a certain affection that the Australian public have for me, and they were, so they were a bit careful. You've always been number one on Q scores. I remember for All many, many, them, many yeah. years, like just the top of the tree with Q scores. So yeah, it, there has been a huge affection. So they knew, but then they they use weasel words like enjoying her curves and those kind of things where it's so (laughs) passive aggressive i know well it's schizophrenic you know Mm. enjoying her new beach body when they (laughs) when they try and get the worst possible shot of you you know you knew though when you signed on to janet did you know listen to me putting words into your mouth that how do you then turn that off it's like once you put that ball into play how do you then go okay guys i'm resigning for from talking about weight in every interview and now i'm i've done jenny craig i've done two years whatever now how do I, you know, drawing a line under it? I don't think you can ever put the, the toothpaste back in the tube, yeah. really. And and I don't think I quite – I didn't know it was going to go off the way it did. Mm. I didn't know it would be as huge as it was. Mm. Um, you, you know, that said, I went into it with open eyes and, and maybe some naivety thinking. I think I, I thought I could maybe control um, – the the debate a bit more and mm. try and bring some common sense into it, mm. and then you just realise it's a mad beast and it's out there <laughs> you know, and you can't. There's nothing you can do. Yeah. There's nothing you can do. Do so. you do you think um, the uh, fact that you came out in 2012 when you lost the weight? Do you think that that was? Well, then I started to put the weight on again. I think. But didn't you, you know, say that, after you came out, you put the weight yeah, back? On? Yeah, I, I I think I felt intensely vulnerable, and mm. and certainly. You know, that idea of fat as metaphor, mm. you know, it, it is sort of a bit like a shield, a bit like armour. Um, and, um, you know, whether it was just that or whether it was just that's what happens, you know, very few people. Like the, yeah. the statistics for people who lose weight and keep it off are, are diabolical. It's like mm. about 3% I've since discovered. Mm. So it's, you know, the chances of keeping it off, it's very hard. Um, but I think um, um, – Really, you know, that whole thing of coming out has was a really interesting. Um, what what happened initially after it? There's a whole other myth too about like losing weight, like everything's going to be perfect. I so love that was so thing. interesting to read. I thought, oh, you've come out now. It's like you'll run down the street, like yeah, yeah. throw Being your hat in the yeah, air. Yeah, yeah, no, I was shit scared. Um, yeah, because you know, and this is where that sort of um, Polish European legacy adheres because. Um, the, the, I grew up with this intimate knowledge of that the world can take a very dark turn. Mm. And there's always, it's just in me to have that slight mistrust mm. of the mob, you know, and the way things can go, which is weird because I've made, I, in some ways I've I've gone straight into that fear. By My whole career is about dealing with masses of people. But yeah. at the same time, I have this thing of, you know, looking at, you know, seeing those pictures of the Holocaust with my father sitting in the lounge room and going, this is how horribly wrong it can go. And that's always been part of my operation system that's how I'm hardwired mm. um, and so you know much as I could reason with it there was that primitive part of me that when I came out was terrified that it would backfire somehow horribly and it must have looked to people um, you know watching on the sidelines like it was 2012 you know lots of people will try and say everyone knew everyone didn't know a sliver of people who live on the you know the east coast and in the arty farty world knew but the broader population really didn't have a clue that I was gay so it was a big thing to still um, and um, the other thing is, you know, I can't really name very many other A-list female celebrities who are out. Mm-mm. So I was a bit out there on my own, and it's it's still not happening. I mean, where are they, you know? Um, so this idea that, that people sort of want to rewrite history in some ways and go, oh, it wasn't such a big deal, and everyone knew anyway, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah. no, that's not really true, you know. And I, I was blazing a path in some ways in that, there was all this speculation about how it would affect brand Magda, mm-hmm. whether I'd still get endorsements or not. You know, you talked about long conversations with your agents before you yeah. came. Like I spoke to my parents, I spoke to and I spoke to my agents, and I thought, yeah, brand Magda, what yeah. was? Because that's your life. How would. do you talk about that? Like, how do you? Well, you, I just how had did to, that factor in? Um, well, I just had to um, really. Um, acknowledge that it, it could affect my livelihood. I might not get mm. endorsements. Um, uh, and um, I just had to do it anyway because it was time. It was the right time for me. And I'm very big on that, that um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that 
I don't think anything is all good or all, all bad. Things are complex. And um, coming out, you know, this idea that you come out and it's all great, it isn't that way for everyone. It's complex. It depends on your circumstances. It's not always safe. It depends on your own history, where you live, all that sort of thing. And you have to, you can't just go, yeah, come out and it'll be great. As it turns out for me, it was one of the most empowering and healing things I've done. And in some ways it healed that old Eastern European wound because nothing terrible did happen. And mm. and that part of me, you, I bet you get that part, don't you? That totally. sort of, you know, that, that we it's just like have, you've been waiting for the other shoe to drop your whole life. For, yeah, totally. And it didn't, you know. And, and that in itself was an incredibly healing thing for me. It's very hard. Um, you talk about you're the last of the generation that are the walking wounded in terms of um, people who grew up realising they were gay before probably the 90s. Yeah, so before it's, it was it's, legal. It's re- Exactly. It's really mm. hard when you're talking to Gen Ys, I imagine, to explain, oh, yeah, everyone's out and Miley Cyrus thing, you know, and gender fluidity yeah. and Caitlyn Jenner on the cover of Vanity Fair. What do you mean you were worried about it? Like, it, yeah. how, just talk to, like, I loved what you talk about your um, coming to terms with your sexuality and uh, when you were a kid and a teenager and, and an adolescent and, and how, you, you know, first you noticed you had special feelings for Marsha Brady yeah. <laughs> and then you watched old movies and, and with, you know, you didn't identify with Vivian Lee and Grace Kelly. You wanted, you identified with the male leads and that you wanted to sweep them off their feet. I loved that idea of coming to terms with your sexuality through popular culture because there were no role models in the media. No, I'd never seen another lesbian. So there was no one who I could um, – how was I even supposed to know what these feelings were or understand them? I'd kind of heard the word, um, didn't – and started wasn't to realise – around much though, was not, it? Not much and started to realise with mounting horror that that was what I was. Mm. Um, so all I had was these feelings towards other women – um, but I had never seen a lesbian. You know, I, as far as I knew, I was the only one. You know, it was oh. terrifying. And that sort of isolation, uh, it's its interesting as people are reading the book, so many people of my generation come up to me and go, oh, my God, I went through that. There, 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 there are some women of my generation who still don't feel comfortable with the word lesbian. Mm. You know, it's really a lot of damage was done to us and as I say you know you don't go from the discourse of shame to the discourse of pride with nothing but a parade to get you through that damage is done and then mm. psychological mm. work needs to be done to do the healing it, the I love the scene in your book where you come out to your parents god it's funny oh. I laughed and I cried <laughs> in the space of two pages it was so funny oh, um, they're gorgeous they're adorable your parents <laughs> my, your mum you, you say that she's the funny one in the family she you just is. Oh, I just can hear her voice, even though I've never actually heard it just from your writing. Um, and you sort of, you thought you were going to be outed by a magazine, by an interview that you'd done um, when someone had alluded to rumours. Mm. And I thought it showed such um, incredible conviction that you just got up and walked out of that interview. Yeah. Um, none of that, oh, please like me. And da, da, da. it was yeah. just like, you know, here's my boundary and I'm walking out. I yeah, I was that. surprised I found that actually. Yeah. I didn't I didn't think that would be how I would react. Um, and I just did. I I always knew um, because, uh, you know, early on, and I describe this in the book, I was, when I was at uni, I was a little radical lesbian feminist. I found my gang. I was working in a women's refuge. You um, ticked every cliche. I You're really did. Women's I refuge. know, I know. I was so happy. You yeah. short hair, so, you wore overalls. I wore overalls. <laughs> I was like that. Yeah, I was that cliche. I, no every, bra. No, every lesbian goes through, <laughs> nearly every lesbian goes through some point when they shave their head. We all, yeah. It's just a rite of passage. You kind of have to do it. Um, and um, But then I did find that too constraining mm. and I didn't want to be marginalised and ghettoised and I knew, uh, I started to realise I wanted to be a performer and I knew that I wanted to work on a large stage. You know, I wasn't mm. one of those people that wanted to play to 200 lesbians in a tent somewhere mm. and mm. I've got plenty of friends who do that and they do amazing work but they feel that frustration that they can't break through into mm. the mainstream. Um, so um, I can't remember where we were going with the question. What was that? Um, it was about- so you worked in the refuge and everything, and it was about the process of deciding to come out to your parents. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, so um, I'd kind of come to terms with my lesbian identity, mm. and then when I started doing degeneration 
and it was a very straight world. Lovely people, but, you know, mm. as I describe it, comp- compared to the polymorphously perverse people I'd been with at uni, it was like <laughs> moving in with the Waltons. So, um, Love that. Yeah, so it was um, – uh, I, I had gone through this whole process of – going in and out of the closet, as it were. Like, Mm. I was quite out when I was at uni, and then I sort of retracted and then um, had this interview. And and I'd always – I always knew that no matter what, I wouldn't lie, that Mm. I would never, ever lie or put up a front or pretend to be straight. But I wasn't sure what I would do when I was flat out asked. And this woman said to me, you know, so there are rumours and one of them is that you're a homosexual. How do you feel about that? And this extraordinary sang froid came over me and I just said, oh, I don't care. And I was amazed. I was like, honestly, I was like James Dean. I was just so cool. It's the only time in my life I've been I cool. And, I but I have to leave Yeah, now. but I've got to go now. And I just whacked up a huge boundary and went, you know, deal with that sucker and, um, uh, and left. But then went and t- came, then decided had you had to, yeah, had a meltdown <laughs> and decided you had to tell your parents and your yeah. brother was there. It's yeah. the most fabulous scene. Just, just talk us through it. Oh, so I, I went, my brother at that time was a real, he was, um, rides motorbikes, his cars and motorbikes are his thing. And he had a beard like ZZ Top <laughs> down to his, down to his navel, um, and a big Harley belt buckle. And it gorgeous and a plait, you know, his hair plaited. And I, and I told him, and he was like, yeah, all right, you know. Whatever. And whatever. I, I told him ages ago. Yeah. He knew like years ago. But I told him I was going to tell mum and dad. Yeah. And he said, if they attack you, I'll come with you. I said, will you come there and be an example of someone in the family who's okay about it and just sort of show them the way. You he know? said a really interesting thing to you. He said, "If because you were famous by that stage, and he yeah. said, if they're going to wear you as a sparkly coat to impress yeah. their friends or something like that, then they also have to you Take know, the good with yeah. the bad. To, yeah. well, not that this is bad, but yeah, they have to yeah. accept every part of you. Yeah, that's oh, right. That was really wise. I know. It was beautiful. Um, mm. What a great big brother. Mm. Um, and um, so he came along and he was sitting at the breakfast bar and it was a Sunday night. Um, my parents my parents live like in Baroni, which is like 30 k's out of Melbourne. And, um, and my mum... Uh, uh, <laughs> Said, oh, 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 this is a this is an unusual time to visit, and I said, um, um, well, I'd like to talk about something actually. Because can we turn the television off? I want to talk about something. And she went, oh, yes, we'd love to chat. She had no idea what she was in for, <laughs> and uh, so we turned the TV off. And um, then she said, so what do you want to talk about? And I said, um, well, I suppose we should talk about the fact that you know, I'm in my early, thir- early 30s, and there's never really been mention of a boyfriend. She went. Oh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and dad just sort of was, you know, and it just all went from there. And she kept asking questions and dad was put up his hands defensively and wanted to know, but didn't want to know. And, you know, but in the end, they were absolutely gorgeous about it. And she said things like, oh, there's a lot of you around now. Yeah, she said, she said, um, she said, oh, there's an awful lot of you around. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude. That's not rude, is it? You know, <laughs> she was so cute. And and she kept leaning going, I'd say we're talking about my sexuality. And she'd go, uh-huh, uh-huh. Which is, <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't want to use the word lesbian. No, I thought that would have been too confronting. Yeah, yeah. And, and even I, and, in the project, and, you didn't want to. Uh, let me just define my terms here. Um, I identify as gay myself. Now, um, when I say that, what I'm saying is that I am n- absolutely not straight. I wouldn't define myself as bisexual either. Yeah. I would say I am like gay, 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 gay. A little bit not gay, 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 gay. gay. <laughs> No, I, I, well, also because my sexuality is a little bit complicated. I'm not a hungy, you know. There's, I'm not hungy. 100%. 100%. Oh, 100%. Yeah, not a hungy. I love that. Yeah, well, there's a lot of us who are like that. There are, you know, there's a Kinsey scale of the, you know, the one to six, you know, those who are completely heterosexual and those who are completely gay. And I'm somewhere, you know, pretty far up the gay end, but not totally. There's a bit of a stampede into that section, isn't yeah. there, really? Like, <laughs> there in is. terms of everyone wants to, like, fall over each other now, which is hilarious, yeah. probably, for, for your generation who, and my generation who would have grown up hiding it. Now everyone's like, you know, I'm just a bit fluid and I'm not gay. I'm just having a relationship with a woman. You know, I hear that all the time. Kristen Stewart's very strong on that line. Yeah. 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 And now they're not even just gay. They're gender fluid. So maybe I'm not even a uh, woman. Miley Cyrus, I could be also sometimes a boy. I think think, uh, Ruby Rose takes that line a little bit too. So it's kind of like, um, you know, being a, a boring old lesbian is just really conservative yeah. in a way. Yeah, it is. Well, uh, yeah, I know, exactly. Um, but um, that was why in some ways it was e- easier for me to come out in 2012 yeah. because that conversation was around. Mm. Had I come out earlier, I would have been absolutely 
labelled as a lesbian, mm. I would have had to, you know, even um, some people who were advising me were saying, don't go there, don't complicate it, just say you're gay, you don't want to, because, um, what's her name, the redhead from Sex in the City? Oh, Cynthia so, Nixon. Cynthia Nixon. She's got into all sorts of trouble she got with into defining all, herself, hasn't Exactly, she? she really did. And so some, someone was advising me saying, don't go there, you'll mm. get a shitstorm come down on you. And I was like, and I felt so back-footed then, and I was like, no, I... The whole point of coming out is so I can be my real self. Yeah. And that's... You Not know, put yourself into a different box that doesn't oh, fit. Oh, well, exactly, mm. exactly. Um, and that was when I came up with the gay, 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 little bit not gay, which oh, I just God, thought... Such a con- fabulous line. Oh, thanks. And it just expresses who I am, what my experience has been like. And it was funny, you know, and really not too funny. serious about it. And Were you nervous that night? Yeah, I was. I was really nervous, yeah. Because I felt I knew... That there were very that I was probably the first one of the first A list celebrities who mm-hmm. had who's been in you know a household name who had this opportunity to speak on behalf of so many millions mm. of Australians mm. um, and that most of most of the LGBTQI people never get that opportunity to express what it's like what it feels like and what we're up against and to try and advance the cause of marriage equality mm. so I felt a huge responsibility because I didn't want to just come out. It wasn't just a question of coming out for myself. It was I really wanted to to be a part of that. And that's why you chose that time. I wanted to read the statement that that, um, you came out with. You you said, we pay taxes, fight wars for this country, nurse you when you are sick, make you laugh, sing and dance for you, play netball for you, star in your movies, cook your meals, decorate your store windows. And chances are gay people designed whatever it is you're wearing. All Australians, including gay Australians, should have exactly the same rights, including the right to love, marry and take care of our partners. So how did you write that? How did you come up with that statement and what was behind it for you? Um, Well, I kind of wanted to you know, ease into it, the whole thing, and, and, and kind of get people's attention because, um, you know, there's no point... If you're doing something like that for a cause, you you, you want people to be listening, otherwise it, it falls mm. on deaf ears mm. and it's no use. Mm. So um, we had this whole kind of strategy going, and it was sort of hilarious. It was like the war room, you know. There was Karen, Alex Greenwich, Greenwich from um, Marriage, Marriage Equality, Equality, Karen yeah. Phelps. And Jackie Stricker And Jackie Stricker Phelps. Phelps. Um, and uh, another friend of mine, Jo Jarvis, who who helped out as well. She was fantastic. And you were saying Karen's, but Karen had been encouraging you to come out for a long time. Yeah, she had. She because she knew, um, like their their journey was was pretty rocky. Like they were, it was. Out, yeah, they were outed and they had a hard they time. They were pioneers, weren't they? They really were. But she also knew how amazing it feels afterwards. Um, so she wanted you to come out not for the sake of the movement but for you. Yeah, yeah. She wanted me to feel the freedom that she and Jackie felt, mm. which was, a, you know, so lovely of her. Mm. Um, she's a great friend. She's a good woman. Good woman, really good woman. Um, and um, so we had, we, you know, we'd have these hilarious meetings. It was so fun, you know, planning it. War room. War room and talking about w- what I'd say. And, and then I just really had to find my own language around it and, and feel as comfortable with it and own it myself. Um, because if, I'm, if I feel I'm parroting um, someone else's agenda or a cause, even though I was speaking on behalf of the cause, I, I, I don't do that very well. Um, yeah. You know, I have to really feel it. And you, um, you talked about uh, when you lost the weight, you were worried that, you know, people put all their own baggage onto it and it's like, oh, you don't lose too much, you still yeah. want to be funny. And you suddenly started to wonder if you'd still be able to, as you put it um, so beautifully, feel the vibration of Sharon, who you were playing at that time in Kath yeah. and Kim. And did it make you feel different in yeah. terms of, of, of your comedy? Yeah, it did. It actually really did because um, – it's not that I'm saying that you you um, you have to be unattractive to be funny. I'm not playing into that thing. There are lots of beautiful women who are hilarious, mm. but my shtick was very much around a particular f- physical shape. In the same mm. way that um, John Cleese has that stick insect body, and he makes mm. that's his shtick. Mm. Being overweight and using my body in a particular way was part of really how I. That was a big part of what my uh, comedy persona was, mm. and so. Um, and, you know, do you remember um, the Mary Tyler Moore show and her friend Rhonda lost Very all the well. weight and mm. just it all went to shit? Mm. You know? mm. There were things like that where it was just like, you know. A few male comedians, same thing. Yeah, mm. yeah. It, it's it's actually not an easy thing to negotiate. You, mm. you People do see you in a different way. They take you they take you a little bit more seriously. Yeah. Even, even when you're, 
you, you know, not um, trying to be serious, it just shifts everything. It really does shift the vibration quite significantly. Um, so, you know, that thing of, you know, even with this book, it's interesting that some people just really want it to be about Sharon Strezlecki. Mm. They don't want to know about the darker side of things, even though once they read the book they love it. But before they come to it, they, they have a, a perception of me that they really want to maintain. But how much control did you have over the cover? It's one of my, I just love it. It's just so oh, thanks. unadorned and not like. It ain't a celebrity photo, is it? <laughs> no, I love it. And it's oh, everything thanks. about the book. Right. Oh, well, funnily enough, I didn't want my picture to be on the cover. I would have loved to. Publisher would have loved that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was never going to happen. <laughs> Little did I know. I was thinking, yeah, they're going to let me do that. No, I, I would have loved to be in that have... meeting. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, like exactly. your mum when you came exactly. out. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Not on the cover. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> you should be on the cover. <laughs> I wanted to have just like a white cover with my name and reckoning, <laughs> but they, they, went, they, they just said, no, that doesn't work for us. Um, but, um, um, yeah, I really very much wanted to not have a celebrity. It's not a celebrity memoir, and I wanted it to register as that. And, and as I said before, this book, it's really the real me, you know. And, um, you know, at the age of 54, if you can't be the real you, when can you be, really? Thanks for listening to this interview with Magda. Isn't she amazing? Find her book. You're going to want to read it after listening to this podcast. You can find Reckoning at apple.co forward slash Mamma Mia. You can go and download it immediately. And if you like this episode and are looking for ones you may not have heard before, scroll back through my feed and look for the interview with Richard Glover about his memoir, Flesh Wounds. There's loads and loads of interviews in the feed. If you're on a car trip, hanging out at the beach, trying to escape from your family. We've got you covered in the No Filter feed. The No Filter producer is Eliza Ratliff and I'm Mia Friedman. Follow me on Instagram at Mia Friedman or on Facebook and I will see you on mamamia.com.au.